Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, silence, please. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Stephen Flanagan, Senior Vice President and Henry A. Kissinger Chair here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And it's a pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of our, our partners, the Polish Institute for International Affairs. Uh, and the, uh, our sponsors, the uh, uh, NATO Public Diplomacy Division and Rolls-Royce North America. It's, a, it's great to see you all here. It's a real testament, I think, to our, to our speaker that we could turn out such a good crowd early uh, on the first Monday after, after Thanksgiving. Um, but it is an interesting time for NATO, and we're delighted to have this chance to provide you with, uh, if not a comprehensive, certainly a fulsome review of the, the Lisbon summit accomplishments and the way ahead from Lisbon. What are the key challenges confronting NATO? And that's very much going to be the topic of our speaker today. I have to first, of course, ask you uh, the usual admonition. Please turn off all devices that buzz or groan or make noises uh, before we start so our speaker is not interrupted. And let me take just a brief moment to, uh, to introduce him. You have uh, some more bio information on him, but uh, it is a pleasure to introduce the Admiral who has served as both NATO's Supreme Commander Europe uh, and a Commander of the U.S. European Command since July of 2009. I'm sure it seems longer to him. Uh, the uh, Admiral Stavridis, he took the helm, and that, that is because, in all seriousness, he took the helm, and I should say it was the helm. He's the first naval officer to serve as NATO's top operational commander at a time of great challenge to the alliance with Afghanistan and, and five other significant operations around the world, and many questioning the alliance's fundamental direction and purpose. But I think, uh, as many of you who know him, he is just the right officer to need NATO at this challenging period. He's a proven leader of complex military operations, a deep strategic thinker, and a military statesman in the tradition of some of the finest SACURAs. And, of course, he was an effective practitioner of smart power long before that became uh, the vogue in Washington. And uh, those of you who have tweeted with him know he has boundless energy and is a great communicator, able to, uh, to tell NATO's story clearly to wide-ranging audiences, uh, and from senior members of Congress uh, to European parliaments to, to young people in the blogosphere. Just a brief word about his background for those of you who don't know him. A native of South Florida and the son of a career Marine Corps officer, he won an appointment to the Naval Academy, uh, where he was a distinguished grad of the class of 1976. He was commissioned as a surface warfare officer and served at sea on carriers, cruisers, and destroyers. He went on to er earn his uh, master's and PhD degree at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in 1984, where he, he, where he was the top student of his class. He's also a distinguished graduate of the National War College. Back at sea, Admiral Stavridis commanded the destroyer USS Barry, completing deployments in Haiti, Bosnia, and the Persian Gulf. He went on to command the Enterprise Carrier Stra uh, Strike Group and the Persian Gulf in support of both Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Ashore, he has served as a strategic and long-range planner for the staffs of the Chief of Naval Operations and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and as Director of the Navy Operations Group uh, Deep Blue. He's also served an as an executive assistant uh, to the Secretary of the Navy, Richard Danzig, and as a military, senior military assistant to Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. In October 2006, another first, he became the first Navy officer to lead U.S. Southern Command, where he made great strides in, in reshaping counterinsurgency and narcotics assistance to Colombia, but where he also helped improve attitudes towards the United States throughout the region through a dynamic and creative uh, strategic uh, security cooperation uh, strategy. So his energy and commitment to new missions is exemplified by the fact that when he took over Southern Command, his French was excellent, but he spoke no Spanish. So he put himself uh, into a crash course uh, to learn the language. Well, he came to NATO then, clearly, knowing the other official language of the alliance. But as Secretary Gates noted when he appointed him, uh, he had to learn to speak NATO. Well, I think those of you who know uh, how he's been performing these uh, last 16 months know he's doing quite well on that assignment, and we look forward to his review and assessment of the key challenges that he sees in implementing the guidance that uh, he and his other fellow commanders have received uh, from the Lisbon Summit. Admiral Stavridis, welcome to CSIS. Thanks, Thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. I am going to use uh, just a couple of slides, but if you're still uh, overcoming the little bit of sleepiness from uh, Thanksgiving, I, I assure you they're not uh, devastatingly boring PowerPoint slides. Um, they're really just a few images to kind of move our conversation along this morning. <clears throat> Steve, thank you for that, that far too generous introduction. I will, uh, 
I will do my best to avoid uh, speaking anything other than uh, clear and simple English this morning. Um, but what I'd like to do, first slide please, is, is simply talk about the alliance for a few moments. And then I'll try and give you a bit of a report from the Lisbon summit. And then I'll talk about, and I think this is what we're really interested in, um, kind of what's the next step? What are we going to move forward on? What are some of the key issues that we're going to try and focus on? And of course, in that segment, I'll talk a bit from my particular perspective as the Supreme Allied Commander, which is a very exalted title, but what it really means is I'm the operations officer for NATO. So I get to operationalize a lot of the ideas that come out of the summit. Just to kind of put us on the same sheet of music, next slide. Um, I often start a presentation by talking about bridges. This, of course, is uh, a bridge over the Drina River. It's in the Balkans, and it, it figures in the title of an extraordinary novel, The Bridge on the Drina, by Andro Ivic, who won the Nobel Prize. Uh, this bridge, of course, is in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Today, I would thematically think a little bit of the alliance as a bridge in time, a temporal bridge. It is a bridge that I think connects both Europe and North America, the partners, as well our larger set of partners, our partners for peace, many of whom are represented today, and indeed potential partners like Japan uh, and others uh, who are part of the global set of actors for security and good. So today when I speak of NATO, I'll talk a little bit about the alliance as a bridge in time from this Cold War to this new world that emerged after the Cold World. And today I think we're in a bit of a new, new world. So I'll be talking a, a fair amount about that bridge in time that I believe NATO is and where that bridge is headed. Next, please. We should start by thinking to ourselves, why does NATO exist? <clears throat> this is a very tragic photograph. It's the graveyard at Verdun. Uh, a battlefield in the First World War. And I put it here as, as emblematic of the terrible wars that swept Europe and really swept the world in the 20th century. I mean, this was a devastating period in Europe and, and really throughout the world. This battlefield at Verdun, in 1916, over a 300-day period during the battle, <clears throat> a thousand people a day died. 1,000 a day for 300 days. This cataclysmic series of wars that swept Europe and swept the world uh, really was the, the creation point, if you will, uh, of NATO in a certain sense. NATO was designed to avoid this kind of cataclysmic conflict. Next, please. And so we see a, a NATO that emerges in the Cold War period. And look at that photograph. It's crisp. It's precise. We knew who we were. We knew what we did. That was the NATO of the Cold War period. It was sharp. It was clear. Everything was very defined for us. Next, please. So then the Berlin Wall falls. And just as this photograph is a little bit out of focus, even so you can sense the jubilation in it, the great sense of wonder that the world is really changing. And there is a, a sense of real optimism at this moment, a sense that a, a new world is emerging. Next slide. It didn't turn out quite as optimistically as we had all hoped. The new world, I would argue, has moved in time into a kind of a new, new world, one that is very challenging for us, that presents a, a very discrete set of challenges to the alliance. And I think that set of challenges is what energized the alliance as it drafted this new strategic concept. So let me talk a bit about that. As you all know, the first strategic concept was written decades ago. The most recent one was in 1999, <clears throat> 10 years ago. So this new strategic concept that is emerging, I think very accurately, uh, looks at the, the thread of threat and provides us with a way ahead. And that's what I'll talk about this morning. Next, please. So I'll start with a, a challenge that may surprise some of you who might have thought, well, the SAC year will start by talking about Afghanistan and terrorism. 
Those are certainly parts of our challenges. But I would argue demographics is a challenge, and it's one that we should consider and think about. This is not a NATO problem to solve, but as we look at declining populations, particularly in Europe, in Russia, in the Baltics, in the Balkans, in parts of Western Europe, as these populations decline in numbers, we will have security impact. Uh, first of all, almost all of our forces today are all volunteer forces. 25 or so, 24 of the NATO nations are now all volunteer forces. So finding that recruiting pool is going to be more challenging. We're also going to be spending more of our tax dollars on social services to support an aging population. All of this will create challenges in the security realm. Now, these are not NATO challenges to solve, but they are uh, aspects to this security dimension that we must be aware of as we move forward into this 21st century. Next, please. The insurgency in Afghanistan is, of course, a challenge and was very much in mind as the new strategic concept was drafted as we went through the summit. And, of course, the interactions there with President Karzai and the ideas of transition in Afghanistan were very much central to the discussions we had in Lisbon. Afghanistan is a very challenging problem set for the alliance and for the entire ISAF coalition. As you're all aware, NATO, the 28 nations of NATO, are but a part of the larger ISAF coalition, a total today of 48 nations, the most recent being Kazakhstan, who attended the summit. So those 48 nations who are also supported by 70 nations that are providing financial assistance to Afghanistan, all undergirded by the United Nations, all of us, despite all of that great international support, find this to be a very challenging problem set. Next, please. Next slide, please. Look closely at this slide. It represents a challenge closer to the European continent, and it's the Balkans. This is Sarajevo. It's the National Library in Sarajevo, destroyed during the siege of Sarajevo. There you see a cellist playing bravely during the siege. It's a famous story. It's uh, immortalized in a, in a novel, a fictionalized account of this called The Cellist of Sarajevo, uh, which I would recommend to any who would like to understand the kind of fabric of what it was like to be in that city under siege for four and a half years. I put it here to remind us that while there is great progress in the Balkans, and today, in fact, most obviously, Slovenia, Croatia, and Albania are members of NATO. Uh, additional Balkan nations will probably join NATO in the years ahead. We have made enormous progress from a period of time in which we had over 50,000 NATO troops at one time or another in the Balkans. Today, in Kosovo, when I took over 16, 17 months ago, we had 15,000 troops in the Balkans. I reduced that to 10,000. I've just made the recommendation, which has been approved by the Secretary General and the Council, to further reduce the troop levels there to around 5,000. So we've come from 50,000 troops in the Balkans down to only around 5,000. That's great progress. Um, I think we're in relatively peaceful zone in the Balkans today. So we can make progress in these very challenging situations. But I would include the Balkans as part of the area that we must continue to watch and be engaged in to make sure that we do not fall back to photographs like this. Next, please. I worry about missiles, about ballistic missile threat. And the alliance, as you know, during the summit has taken a step to agree to incorporate the U.S. phased adaptive approach missile system with the NATO C-2 command and control capabilities to begin to create a missile defense for the alliance. And I think that's an important step as well. Next, please. Terrorism. Uh, we are all well aware of this. There were 300 kinetic terrorist incidents in Europe over each of the last several years. Uh, many in the North Caucasus, like this photograph, um, some in France, some in Spain. Uh, there are different reasons for it. But terrorism, which is 
within the domestic sphere of the nation states is a law enforcement problem, but NATO has a role to play in supporting this, principally in actions as we are undertaking today in Afghanistan to ensure that we don't suffer additional attacks uh, from Al Qaeda and other organizations along those lines. Next, please. And this is a hard picture to look at. This is a Ukrainian prostitute. She's a victim of heroin addiction and human trafficking. Again, not a NATO problem to solve per se, but the effects of heroin addiction, for example, which is particularly a problem in Russia, which has 30,000 heroin addicts, uh, correction, 30,000 deaths from heroin between the ages of 18 and 24 last year, perhaps a million addicts in Russia. The concern here, in addition to the terrible human cost you see, is that these trafficking routes provide a means to move both heroin, terrorists, weapons, potentially weapons of mass destruction. Also, the funds which come out of this multi, multi, multi-billion dollar business are used to support insurgents in Afghanistan and elsewhere. It creates corruption. It undermines good governance. So, again, not a NATO problem to solve, but NATO has a role in supporting law enforcement in understanding, next slide, these routes, these trafficking routes across which move a great deal of deleterious material, people. This is of concern and is part of the security landscape that was in the mind of the drafters of the strategic concept and at the summit. Next, please. There is also illegal migration, which has a terrible human cost. Here you see a, a group of migrants actually being rescued at sea after their boat uh, drifted in the Mediterranean for uh, some weeks. But additionally, as is the case with the narcotics routes, I am concerned about what flows across in addition to the human cost represented here. So migration, illegal migration, and the use of those routes in that regard, I think, is part of the security fabric. Next, please. And there's piracy out there. Now, Navy admirals get excited about pirates, uh, but I will tell you that in addition to uh, my normal my normal nautical juices flowing at the sight of pirates, in seriousness, we are all concerned about the billions of dollars of cost added to all of our budgets as a result of piracy, of the human cost of this. Hostages are taken. Uh, ships are held hostage. Um, all of this creates enormous discontinuities in the global transportation grid. This particular photograph is a pirate skiff that is under attack by a Danish ship operating under NATO flag off the uh, coast of eastern Africa, off the Horn of Africa. So piracy is part of this uh, fabric of security and challenge. Next, please. Now look closely. What doesn't fit in that picture? There's something strange there. Um, I put it there, it's a whimsical photograph, but I put it there, you know if even the babushkas in the village are breaking out their laptops, you know how vulnerable we all are. You know how dependent we are on cyber. And I would argue that the NATO alliance with its extraordinary sophistication is probably at the highest level of vulnerability. So cyber and cyber defense is very much a part of what we will seek to do coming out of the summit. Next, please. Julian Assange, the leader of uh, WikiLeaks. You need look no further than today's Washington Post and New York Times to understand the need for cyber security. Next, please. High North, there are geographic areas. We need to ensure that the High North, the Arctic, remains, as it is today, a zone of cooperation. Uh, of the nations that border the Arctic region, Four of them are NATO nations, four out of the five principal ones. Um, the organization that works this very effectively is the Arctic Council. Um, this is not an, an area in which I see NATO uh, operating extensively, but it is part of understanding the expanding space in the globe. Uh, and I can see areas in which NATO could be engaged, search and rescue, uh, support to environmental work, uh, again, working together 
with the Arctic Council to ensure that this remains a zone of cooperation as we go forward. Next, please. Let us not discount Mother Nature in terms of our challenges. Uh, these are the forest fires in Moscow, probably a $15 billion event. Um, we need to be able to work together uh, in order to alleviate the kind of challenges that come from this type of operation. So I've given you a bit of a sense of the challenges in the security environment, and I'll add one more to it. Next, please. Which is, these are protesters at Lisbon wearing shirts that say, no NATO. As, as a senior NATO officer, I always remind myself that not everyone views NATO as a global force for good. I think it is. But part of our challenge in the time ahead, in my view, and the strategic concept will help us with this, part of our challenge in the time ahead will be to communicate the role of NATO. So this idea of doing that effectively so that we can win over some of the individuals who are expressing their right to protest NATO will come to see this organization for what it is, which I believe is a global force for good. Next, please. So that brings us to the summit. If we think about all of that as a kind of a, a prelude, a backdrop, a strong alliance that comes from a Cold War background into a new world and now into this new, new world, um, today 28 heads of state uh, are happy because together at Lisbon last weekend, they came together and authorized this new strategic concept. Recall that the last time NATO got together to do a strategic concept, there were only 19 heads of state in that photograph. So this is an alliance that has expanded dramatically since the last time we had a strategic concept. Since the last time we had a strategic concept, we've had the rise of uh, the kind of terrorism that we saw in the photograph of the Twin Towers. We are in this new, new world. Next, please. From a U.S. perspective, if I may don my U.S. hat for a moment, I think the, the summit was regarded as a success both by President Obama, who was in attendance, uh, and, with sec and by Secretary Gates. Um, you can read the quotes. They, they speak for themselves. I would also highlight for this audience President Obama's excellent op-ed, which he published in the New York Times in the days immediately before the summit, which pointed out that this transatlantic link, this European-U.S. relationship, NATO, all a part of that, are the cornerstone of U.S. security. Now, that's a cornerstone, not the whole house. There are many, many bricks in the security of the United States, but I think it's significant that the president uh, would highlight this, and I believe that the summit reinforced that. Next, please. I think the president had a good time. I was, that's my uh, somewhat less handsome head than his uh, <laughs> chatting with him there. Um, next, please. And I think this head of state had a pretty good summit, President Karzai. He came, he spoke uh, very... Uh, I thought extremely sincerely about the gratitude of the people of Afghanistan for the work of the coalition and therefore NATO, which is a part of that coalition. He spoke about the need for a long-term strategic relationship, which all the heads of state validated. He spoke about the progress in Afghanistan. And I think overall uh, the headline from President Karzai was the transition, which will begin next year in 2011 and we will complete, our goal is to complete a security transition to Afghan-led operations by 2014. All of that was discussed, all of that was validated by the heads of state uh, in the presence of and with the participation of President Karzai. Next, please. And above all, my boss, Secretary General Rasmussen, he had a very good summit. I think he felt extremely pleased with the results, not only on the strategic concept, which you see him holding in his hand there. That is literally quite hot off the presses at that moment. In addition to the strategic concept, the NATO-Russia Council, which I'll speak of momentarily, and as well, the NATO-Afghanistan effort that I spoke of a moment ago. All of those things came together uh, very effectively for the Secretary General, and I credit his leadership, his energy, his personal work on drafting the strategic concept. Um, I think He's had an extremely successful start to his tenure. He's now about 15 months into it, and I think the summit, he would say, was a, a highlight for him thus far and a good jumping-off point for where he intends to take the alliance. Next, please. 
So with that as prelude, you must be saying, well, so what do you think about all those challenges and where are we going? Next, please. I like to begin always by saying the comprehensive approach, and that applies to all of us. I would put the comprehensive approach at the, at the, at the top of my list of things that come out of the summit, and the comprehensive approach is everything from learning the languages, that's the Rosetta Stone, to reading and understanding the culture, the literature of the different parties, states, and actors in all of our security dimensions. Um, everything from novels like The Ugly American, which is actually a, a book about how not to do the comprehensive approach, the Afghan campaign, about the first Afghan campaign, that of Alexander the Great. It's a novel by Stephen Pressfield that illuminates a great deal about Afghanistan. Dead Souls by Nicole Gogol, to understand Russian literature is to begin to understand Russia. Cyber Power and National Security, uh, work done here in Washington over at the INSS. Um, there are a million different books to read, but I believe part of the comprehensive approach is the study of languages and the study of literature, culture, history through reading. Next, please. So let's take Afghanistan as an example and talk about the comprehensive approach. Um, if you look at this thematically, around the outer ring, you see the flags of the nations that are engaged. As I said, not only the 28 NATO nations, it's a coalition of 48 troop-contributing nations, 70 that are financially engaged in all this, and of course, at the very top, the United Nations. Uh, bottom right there, photograph of Stefan de Mistura, the high representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations, a key player in Afghanistan. So this comprehensive approach begins with the international partners. And then next ring in, it's the international organizations are part of this. The United Nations, the World Bank, the uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, which represents all of the national developmental uh, agencies in Afghanistan. They are part of this. And then as you go around the ring, you see the private sector. There are over 1,700 humanitarian private sector organizations doing very good work in Afghanistan. And of course, you see diplomats like Ambassador de Mistura, Ambassador Sedwell of Great Britain, who is the Secretary General of NATO's representative. The comprehensive approach is bringing all that together. It's the international, the interagency, the private public, the military, the economic, the diplomatic, the cultural, the linguistic, that's the comprehensive approach. When you succeed, it looks like this. Next slide. That's a young Canadian lieutenant. She's handing out school books to young Afghan girls going to school. Ten years ago, there were less than 500,000 children in school in Afghanistan. Today, there are seven million. Three million of them are young girls like this, like my two daughters, who are receiving an education. In the end, that's the comprehensive approach. We will not deliver security in Afghanistan solely from the barrel of a gun. Let me say that again. We will not deliver security in Afghanistan solely from the barrel of a gun. It takes this comprehensive approach. Now, next slide. Another example of it. Here you see Afghan soldiers holding books. And you might say to yourself, well, that's slightly odd because 80% of Afghans cannot read, sadly. It is a country with low literacy rates. So why would Afghan soldiers be holding books? The answer is because we are teaching them to read. That is the comprehensive approach. Today, the ISAF coalition has 27,000 Afghan soldiers who are learning to read. That may be the most lasting thing we do in Afghanistan in the end. We will teach hundreds of thousands of Afghan soldiers to read. By next summer, we'll have 100,000 Afghan soldiers in literacy training. Now, they're not going to become scholars at CSIS, like my friend Steve Flanagan. They are going to have a third grade to sixth grade facility to read. They will be able to file a police report. They will be able to read license plates. They will be able to record the serial number on their weapons. They will be able to function at a basic level of literacy so they can be Afghan security forces, army and police. So that's part of the comprehensive approach. Next, please. 
And, oh, by the way, we are teaching them to fight. And we do need military effectiveness as part of the comprehensive approach. This idea of building partner capacity, of making security local, is part of the comprehensive approach. That package, I think, and I've simply used Afghanistan as an example, but that package is really part of what we seek to accomplish in the alliance using a comprehensive approach. Next, please. Now, that's a boring picture. It's just a building. But to me, that's a very beautiful building. It's an important building. It's the center of excellence for cyber security. It's in Tallinn, Estonia. And it is very much the beginning. If you think of us kind of on the beach at Kitty Hawk in terms of aviation, we are just beginning in this world of cyber security. This is the beach at Kitty Hawk. It is a place where we are bringing together the nations to begin the discussions about cyber security, cyber policy, and improving our abilities in cyber, all of which are part of the strategic concept and part of what was discussed at the summit. So I look for great things from this center of excellence, and it will be a key focus area for us and particularly for my organization, working with the NATO agencies as we go forward to improve cybersecurity. Next, please. Missile defense. Now, you knew you weren't going to get out of here without having at least one picture of a Navy ship shooting a missile. Um, this is an Arleigh Burke destroyer. I was lucky enough to command one of these, as were several of my friends here in the audience. Um, this is the basis for the phased adaptive approach missile system. It is initially going to be sea-based. We'll see the first few of these ships flowing into the Mediterranean in 2011. And our objective, now that the summit has given us authorization to move forward on this, is to connect the U.S. phased adaptive approach missile system with the NATO command and control. I do not have details on that or how it will all come together. That's one of my principal homework assignments over the next six months, to develop this as a proposal, which will then go forward to the nations of NATO, uh, ultimately for their decision as to how to connect what we call ALT-BMD, which is the NATO Ballistic Missile Command and Control System with the U.S. Phased Adaptive Approach System. Initially sea-based, by mid-decade it will begin to come ashore. All of that to be determined exactly where radars and missiles will go. But I am confident that this system will move forward with success and that the Alliance will incorporate it. I think it's a fundamental responsibility of the Alliance to protect itself from ballistic missile threat. Next, please. We also have exciting micro-technologies. I think that today the age of biology is emerging. These are biometrics. This is using retinal scans. Exploring these kind of micro-technologies uh, is also going to be an important movement forward, and it's something the Alliance will be very focused on in the time ahead. Next, please. And that's the AGS system. I put it there to represent the capabilities, the 10 capabilities that the Alliance has pledged to begin to move toward, one of which AGS. There's a basket of these that focus on Afghanistan, and there's a basket that focus on longer range and newer and emerging threats from ballistic missiles to uh, cyber. Uh, the AGS is moving along well, and I believe it will be part of this capability package in the time ahead. Next, please. Russia. Uh, I was very, uh, very pleased to see the participation of uh, President Medvedev. Here you see him shaking hands with uh, the Secretary General. This was uh, very much a, a handshake that was consummated. It was a, a very good session between President Medvedev and the 28 heads of state of NATO. Uh, we have a basket of real cooperation in a variety of zones as we go forward, and I'll mention a couple of them. Piracy. Uh, today, Russian ships are operating very effectively off the Horn of Africa alongside our NATO and our European Union and other nations. Counterterrorism, counter narcotics. We spoke of uh, a moment ago the narcotics problem, particularly with heroin in Afghanistan. Russian cooperation is very possible in Afghanistan, everything from logistics to uh, MI 17 helicopters. And uh, I would also add missile defense. 
um, details to follow. But all of those topics were discussed and agreed as areas of potential and in some cases current cooperation that we seek to expand uh, with Russia as a, and the phrase from the strategic concept is, as a true strategic partner. Next, please. And here's a photograph to, to help illustrate it. Uh, you know, I'm a Cold War product. I graduated from Annapolis in 1976 and went into the Cold War. In my wildest dreams, I couldn't have imagined this photograph, which, is, which was taken about three weeks ago in Moscow when I was visiting as Sakir, that's a Russian sailor raising the NATO flag at a ceremony in my honor in Moscow. Russia is really reaching out, and I think that we would be well served uh, to find these zones of cooperation. We will not agree on everything. This relationship will have its uh, moments of disagreement, but what I saw at the summit and my direction from the Secretary General and from the nations are to find and expand these areas of cooperation that I mentioned earlier. Next, please. And there's a practical one, MI-17 helicopters. These are superb helicopters. Uh, we would like to get them, more of them flying with the Afghan Air Force. We're building a trust fund. We're discussing how to train the pilots and the crew and the maintainers for these helicopters. These are all areas of potential cooperation with Russia. Next, please. And there are other good partnerships out there. Um, this one is, an, is a slide simply to illustrate the Mediterranean dialogue. These are the flags of the nations that are involved in it. It's mirrored in the Gulf with the uh, Istanbul Cooperative Initiative. We also have strong partnerships uh, really with nations around the world through the ISAF coalition. Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan is engaged in Afghanistan, uh, Korea. We have a, a wide range of partners and partnerships, and that is underlined in the new strategic concept that we should expand these, try and find ways to help integrate the efforts of NATO with other partners as we collectively seek using a comprehensive approach to enhance security. Next, please. And I think Turkey is very important in this regard. Turkey is obviously a, a powerful, important Islamic country. We're very lucky to have them in NATO. They're a strong NATO partner, strong supporter. Their work in Afghanistan has been exemplary, as it has been across the spectrum of alliance activity. Uh, I think using and working with our Turkish partners in a NATO context will help us develop partnerships more strongly in the Islamic world. Very important. Next, please. And we need new ways of thinking about command and control and operations. This is piracy. And here I would say this is not a NATO-led operation at all. We are a participant in it. The European Union, I would say, is the strongest actor. Here you see an example of the European Union and NATO serving, working alongside each other in complementary ways. I think that's an important relationship in the future. It's mentioned in the strategic concept. And as you can see from the slide, you see flags of other nations that are equally involved in this piracy effort, independent ones, including Russia, China, as well as combined maritime forces, a US-led coalition operating out of the Gulf. So it's complicated. It's not simple. It's certainly not just NATO steaming off to try and solve a piracy problem. It is instead this new, new world of global cooperation, of partnerships like this that come together to work on problems, in this case like piracy, which I would freely admit will not be solved at sea. It's going to have to be addressed eventually in the Horn of Africa itself, and I think over time the European Union may be very well positioned to do so. Next, please. And we've got to communicate all this. And we've got to do that vastly better than we do now. And I, I put a few journals along the side. I like academic journals. I've published in a few of them over the years. I think books are important. I've talked about books. But all of that pales by comparison with moving your message in the social networks. That's why I made Facebook the big thing there. I gave a talk at RUSI uh, about a year ago in London, small group. I, I said, as I often do, I'm on Facebook. Friend me. Got a little laugh out of the audience just like that. Ha, ha, ha. Um, there was a reporter in the audience from AP, 
and she wrote a very short article, as AP often does, and the headline was, NATO Admiral Needs Friends. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was nice. It, it, the article got picked up in only two countries. It got picked up in Indonesia and Finland. The next day, I got 250 friend requests from Indonesia and Finland, <laughs> most of which, the ones from Indonesia said, Admiral, I understand you need friends. What is NATO? <laughs> now we laugh, but the point is you reach out to this global audience. You have a chance to explain what NATO is, to educate, to hopefully convince that NATO is a force for good in the world. That's the power of Facebook. The kind of cliche trick question these days is, what's the third largest nation in the world after China and India? It's Facebook nation. There's 500 million people on Facebook today. So using these kind of mechanisms to move, I think, the good ideas that have been generated in the strategic concept and that have come out of this summit will be an important challenge for us in the time ahead. Next, please. The command structure. We have a still too large command structure in NATO. If you can look here, back in the 1990s, we had 40 headquarters and 25,000 people. Now, that's been on a pretty steady downslope, but we're going to cut it even more. We're going to go down to six headquarters and about 9,000 people. Those are big cuts from the Cold War, but they're appropriate. We're going to make them sensibly. We'll do them analytically based and in a militarily sound way, and they will then be debated by all the nations and agreed to. So this is efficiency. This is saving money. This is saving costs, and it's important to do that. This is part of NATO reform that I am involved with. Secretary General is also driving NATO reform in the agencies and in his headquarters in Brussels. But this is my command structure that we are going to be reducing. Next, please. And even so, we'll continue with operations. Next, please. And we will never, never, we will never undervalue the importance of this. This is Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. Article 5 says an attack on one nation is regarded as an attack on all. This is the absolute bedrock of the alliance. So I've talked a lot about a variety of different aspects of the alliance moving forward, but I would want to emphasize the ongoing importance and the bedrock of Article 5. This is what the alliance in the end is all about. Next, please. And it happens, all of this, all these exciting things I've talked about happen in an era in which money is being squeezed. That's a one euro coin, folks. For the Americans in the audience, that, that, that's worth about a dollar forty, uh, but it's squeezed. And so are our finances here in the United States. And so people ask me, what's the biggest challenge in all of this? And I would say it's doing all of these exciting things in an era of declining resources. Now here's the good news. The NATO alliance has a GDP, a gross domestic product, of $31 trillion. This is an extraordinarily wealthy alliance. We have 7 million people under arms, active in reserve, almost all of them volunteers. We have 3,400 ships. This is a big, capable alliance. So will we be able to find the money to do the things I've talked about? I think so, if we do it smart. Just about 100 years ago, there was a, a famous British admiral, Sir Jackie Fisher. Some of you may have read about him. He faced a similar series of cuts, and he said, it's a great line, he said, now that the money's run out, we must all start to think. <laughs> and I think that's where we are today. We must apply intellect to the challenge, and if we do that sensibly, we will be able to deliver the promise of the Lisbon Summit. Next, please. We're going to remain militarily capable in this alliance. I've talked an awful lot about soft power and teaching people to read and school books for children. Those are all important parts of the comprehensive approach. This is the heart of the alliance. Article 5 is the heart of the alliance. We will not let the military capability of this alliance falter. Next, please. 
But I would argue in today's world, and Steve mentioned smart power, in today's world, it's, it's not an on and off switch. It's not as though we have an alliance that goes into combat or sits in a barracks somewhere. We have an alliance that has to be able to operate along the spectrum from soft power to hard power. And that ability to turn the dial and find it in the right place, I would argue that is smart power. That's the challenge for the alliance in the time ahead. Next slide, last slide. Here I want to talk to all of you to conclude. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for being part of this debate, this dialogue, this grand conversation on global security. And I would close by saying that all of you are part of a kind of a wiki. This, of course, is the good wiki. This is Wikipedia. And Wikipedia exists, Wikipedia exists not because 12 geniuses are in a room typing up all that great information. Wikipedia exists because all of us are inputting. All of us are adding to that base of knowledge. You know, it's a perfect metaphor of why no one of us, no one person, no one nation, no one alliance, no one of us is as smart as all of us thinking together. And that's kind of the vision statement of Wikipedia. The vision statement is a world in which every human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. A world in which every human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. I would argue events like this that CSIS is putting on this conversation in which you are all involved, you are helping create the sum of all security. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, the Admiral has about 10 minutes for a few questions. If you could please identify yourself and wait for a microphone. Sure. And also, just to clarify for those journalists that are here, uh, this, uh, the Admiral's remarks and the entire proceedings today are all on the record. Indeed. Uh, Hans Benedict Hans. over there. There's a mic right there, Hans. Hans, you're standing right there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for a great presentation. I'd like to ask you about uh, New Start. Uh -huh. uh, as you know, the administration will be seeking during the lame duck session to get New Start ratified, and uh, there was a call uh, in the communique at Lisbon for ratification, and a number of heads of state did the same. <coughs> um, there was a lot of progress on missile defense, both within NATO and uh, with the Russians. That obviously will allay some of the concerns of those who are potentially opposed to ratification. Uh, there was a, a statement in the strategic concept that said that NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. Uh, and then you just said uh, Russia is reaching out. So I wonder how that all plays in uh, to the upcoming ratification debate. And uh, just to put a sharp point on it, what, from a European perspective, uh, what do you think would be the uh, consequences if START is not ratified? Um, well, first of all, uh, I think, Hans, you've outlined very well the, the view from Europe and the view from the alliance and, and also the view from the administration, which is that the treaty is a good treaty. It makes military sense. It makes strategic sense. And it is also part of our relationship, quite obviously, with Russia, both the United States and, therefore, a part of the NATO relationship as well. So uh, as you articulate, uh, the alliance is in favor of it. The administration is in favor of it. Um, as a senior military officer, I am in favor of it. Uh, I think the treaty is a good one that will advance uh, U.S. interests, and I believe it will also be, have a salutary effect on U.S.-Russian relationships and therefore NATO-Russia relationships, and I think all those things are important. Others? Hi, Sandy Sorsbach from the Air Warfare Center at China Lake. Hi, Sandy. Um, as you were discussing things at the alliance uh, discussion with Russia, did you get a sense of Russian concerns about China's ever-expanding ambitions, especially as they look at Russia's resources? Do they have concerns about China's reaching out toward them in a less than friendly way? I did not hear that addressed, uh, Sandy, at the uh, summit. I think. Um, Russia and China have a, a, a relationship that, from what I can see, is uh, professional and civil. Um, I think personally that uh, a 
a strong Russian relationship with Europe, a strong Russian relationship with the West um, is extremely positive for them, and I think that's a separate discussion uh, for Russian relationships with China. So I would, I would stand on my earlier remarks that uh, over time I am convinced we can find zones of cooperation with Russia that will help orient Russia toward the West, and I think that's of, of great importance. Julian Lindley, French from the Netherlands Defense Academy, Admiral. Um, a subtext for the entire strategic concept was understanding